Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who just got back from swimming in Green Lake. Today I'm going to be reviewing an album by Microphones, called Microphones in 2020, and there is an important detail about them. I have never heard of them. I have never heard of the lead singer who made this song, P.W. Elverbum, Elverson, P.W. P.B. Puffin Stuff. I don't know his name. It's something like Elversum, something like that. Phil something. And I've never heard of him, and that's going to become important later on in the video. Now, I talk a lot about this channel and about how I am a real professor, but I do try to listen to the people who watch this. And the only reason I'm reviewing this, it's not on title, it's only on Bandcamp that I could find, was that two of my viewers suggested it. I'm going to try to read their names. Klal Yuyui and Sai Bayan Nabrula. Hey, you have better names. Uh, but they recommended that I listen to this, and so I listened to it. You know, they gave me homework, and now I'm going to give you homework. This is a 44 minute and 44 second song, a singular song. And listen, I am a real professor, but I call my viewers auditors because I don't assess anything that you give me. I don't give you grades. But I will give you homework sometimes, and I'm actually going to ask you if you take music seriously, if you believe that good music can still be made, that the future of music is just as bright as its past and that its present needs to be studied, then I have to give you homework right now. You not only have to find microphones in 2020 on some streaming service, I believe Bandcamp is the best place to play it. You have to listen to it in three different ways, three different times, all 44 minutes and 44 seconds. That is more important than finishing this video. Let me get more specific. Let me lay out my rubric. Let me lay out my uh, student learning outcomes, the way that I expect you to ingest this music. Read, watch, and listen. First, get it up on Bandcamp and get the lyrics in front of you. It is a 44 minute meditation on life and growing up and entering middle age and thinking about youth, thinking about your younger times, thinking about nature. It is a 44 minute long, epic, slightly solipsistic poem about the self. It is very gratifying to listen to this music, which I will describe in a second, and read the lyrics as they go along. That is my first experience of this album. And about 20 minutes in, I was like, this is an amazing experience. I am so happy that I'm doing this. I feel like I am reading a stranger's diary and it's interesting. There's all these references to P.W. Puffer Stuff's life and his music and his art, and I don't know any of them. I don't know who this guy is for reasons which will become more important soon. I don't know who he is, but I feel like I understand him. I feel like I don't ever have to listen to anything else he's done. I feel like I understand, perhaps even, and I don't use this word very often, there might even be legitimate genius in this 44 minutes and 44 seconds of music that I was able to pick up from this first listen. The second listen, I discovered last night as I was about to record this video, truly. I was, you know, I have like a music stand and I, I try to like get it up and I had the ring light going. And I was like, wait, what? I happened to look up, I did my five minutes of research. There's a music video that goes along with this. A 44 minute and 44 second music video, which you can find on YouTube, which I will link in the comments. Not in the comments, I'll link in the description. Microphones in 2020, a visual experience. It is an amazing music video. It is a music video which is exclusively Phil Hufflepuff, showing pictures from his life, pictures which he took. And it goes along perfectly with the music, the music which is very reflective of the self, incidentally reflective of the culture, and reflective of nature. And all of that goes in, to the point where you have a feeling, and uh, while I was, you know, while I did some research, it, it turns out that this guy has returned home after being away for a period of time. And I have felt this album in my life when I returned to my parents' house and discovered the boxes of pictures and boxes of photographs, or when I look at the photographs that exist and I, I see my younger self, it turns out <clears throat> me and uh, Fluffernutter are like the same age, right? Like he was born in 78, I was born in 77. Very similar times. 
the, the look that I, the way that I feel looking at a picture of my younger self, that bittersweet, like understanding the innocence, understanding that I am completely different and entirely the same. If I were a better artist, I would try to make a 44 minute song about that, but I can't and microphones have. To inspire myself while making this video, I looked through my own photo albums. And I'm gonna show you the photo that I'm looking at while I'm recording this. This is a photo of me in around 2002. So I was, you know, 24, 25. And I was on a container ship traveling from Hamburg to Montreal. I used to be really afraid of flying and that was a way I got around having to fly. And this look on my face, this selfie that I took before selfies, before I had a cell phone really, and, and the, the container ships in the back and the ocean in the distance. This picture says something to me which I wish I could capture in art, but I can't. I can't really express what it feels like to see me at that age, to know that I am that person, sad, heartbroken, alone, excited, creative, energetic, all these things that have left. If an artist, could put that together, make a music video out of it, make a song that expresses it, it would be a great work of art, and that is what has happened with the microphones. I'm going to stop saying that guy's name because I just don't, I just don't have it. It's, I know it's kind of funny when I call him other things, but the microphones guy. Okay, so that's the first two. Read the lyrics while listening, watch while listening, and the nice thing is the lyrics are also on the music video. So you can go along and watch it. If you're only gonna do one, watch the video because it also has the lyrics. But then there's a third thing you have to do because the thing that this artist is able to do, and I only know this from this one song, this one song and this one album makes it very clear to me that he is from somewhere in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. He references all these locations all over Seattle, all over Washington, I mean. He actually doesn't say Seattle, he says everywhere else. He's apparently from some place in Washington called Anacortes. I don't know how they pronounce it, that's how I'm gonna pronounce it. And the feeling and the connection of nature, the omnipresence of the sea, of the trees, of the dirt, is everywhere in this music. So the third way you have to listen to this is you have to go for a drive. I'm sorry, I'm a, I give a lot of assignments. I'm actually a very easy grader in real life, but I give a lot of assignments because I want to give people the chance to really learn something. Drive and listen to this music. This one song with this pulsating rhythm is the perfect kind of rhythm to just drive and listen and see the trees go by. Now, I drove to Green Lake outside of Syracuse, New York, and I put myself and I went hiking and I went swimming and I had all that whole experience. Just drive anywhere into nature. Just drive 44 minutes into some direction and have this music on in the background after having read the lyrics, after having reread the lyrics and watched the music video. This is as quality of a, an experience as you will get from any art anywhere. I'm serious. Music, symphony, cinema, museums. This experience of relating with this artwork so deeply, three times over, you get so into this album that when you're done listening to it for the third time, two minutes later, you go, you know, I could actually, I could, I could go for microphones again. I was driving out to Green Lake. My two kids are in the back. My wife, the Dr. Mrs. Payne was next to me and she was reading, she was reading about his life. And she told me all the things that I know about him. Interesting things, funny things, sad things. <clears throat> It made me realize where I wanted to go with this video. Um, I'm actually gonna be comparing it a lot with a Bob Dylan song from this year, A Murder Most Foul. A Murder Most Foul, if you haven't seen my video on it, it's up there. Uh, it's my only real negative video. I think the song is garbage. I love Bob Dylan, and I talk about how much I love Bob Dylan, but Bob Dylan fans are all jerks, by the way. Never ever insult Bob Dylan. Is it Nobel Prize not enough to say that, anyways. Um, so I want to compare it to that song because both songs are extravagantly long. Both songs have chords and instrumentation, but it's very loose. Both songs are barely songs in a way. They're both too much song and not enough at the same time. 
They're vehicles for lyrics. They're vehicles for this kind of experimental mode of just dumping poetry on poetry on poetry. But it's also, I believe, a very effective means of generational expression. The reason that I don't like A Murder Most Foul is I believe it is beneath Dylan. The kind of analysis that he's doing is a kind of whitewashed history of America since 1963. It is the kind of baby boomer CNN, the 60s schlock that I associate with We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. It's not because Bob Dylan is bad. It's because Bob Dylan is great that that is a bad song, in my opinion. Some people have actually, read my, the comment section, a lot of people make good arguments as to why I'm wrong. I could be wrong. In these videos, when I talk about Bob Dylan, I talk about him as being a messianic figure of the baby boomer. I call him Boomer Jesus, and boomers don't like that. But do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call the microphones guy, Phil Elversums, I'm gonna call him the Exer Jesus. Do you know, do you know why? I'd never even heard of him. This dude is so Generation X that he existed for like 25 years making presumably great music and I was never even cool enough to know. Reading his biography is almost a parody of a Generational Xer biography. Like he's into photography and he prints stuff with expired film and apparently now he's back at his house and he's building a house with his brother and this kind of like this great sort of distance that he has while also bringing you in, not quite whiny, but very personal, very se like self-facing, very insouciant. This song feels, in a way, like an X or anthem without having to go through the whole thing. And then 9-11 came and then we said, not like that. There's only one tangible reference that is a linchpin in the X or experience, and that is the suicide of Kurt Cobain which he calls the death of Kurt Cobain. Interesting choice. And that's in the middle of the song. But that isn't used as some kind of like, oh man, remember growing up in the 90s? It's, it is a psychological portrait, I feel. I relate to this music as a portrait of myself as much as I do a portrait of Phil Elversomb. Even though I don't know that much about him. I wasn't married to the lady from Brokeback Mountain for a year, apparently. I don't know the story there. I didn't grow up in the Pacific Northwest. Most of the bands that he references aren't bands that I listened to and liked, but there's a kind of, of resigned ambition that I've always related to. And I, th I, I believe, I believe if I did not have a fear of failing, an inherited fear of failing, um, I would have been a musician. I would have actually gone for it. I would have continued to make music on four tracks and super, you know, because at this point in my life, I was making music and writing songs all the time and they're all about my life and they're travel logs and they were personal and they were this and that. And then when I learned that I could write a paper <laughs> and that teaching, people actually liked it when I taught. They didn't like it when I sang because I sucked. But still, I would still be at it. If I didn't have that fear of failing, I'd probably still be at it. I'd still be a musician. I wouldn't be here on this YouTube channel. So here we go. My basic idea of maybe this guy, Phil Elversum, let's say that, that sounds the most right that I've said it, is a kind of Generation Xer genius, uh, Jesus, a kind of messianic figure, a symbolic representation of our generational position, attitude, expressions, hopes, fears, and loss. Woo! 14 minutes and three seconds in, and I haven't even talked about the song yet. Well, it's one long song. According to Bandcamp, it was recorded between May 2019 and May 2020. It is basically one guitar, one acoustic guitar, and then another acoustic guitar doing two different chords the entire song. At times there's overdubs, at times there's slight changes, and I'm gonna go over every change. You can see the view, the, how long this video is. It is gonna be a long video, okay? He's able to create a great atmosphere all the way throughout. I think the way that he does it is that it starts off with a long intro, a long overture, like nine minutes of just two guitars. And they're acoustic guitars playing two different chords. And my son, who's a better drummer than I am, and I'm a mediocre drummer, he's actually quite good, 
I asked him like, what time signature is this in? Cause it's like, dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun, dun. But then it kind of changes and the guitars aren't playing quite the same thing. So it's kind of a like a five, four, four, four thing constantly going on. It never feels like, you know, rush. It never feels like tool. It never feels like it's trying to be too complicated, but it feels like it creates this atmosphere. And more than any other kind of catchy song that you can have, this atmosphere is catchy. And that third viewing, that third listening, where I was driving through the hinterlands of Syracuse, you know, outside of Syracuse, through this, like, all these trees and, and like, and, and, the, and the, the, the guitars playing, and, like, you just want to live in the atmosphere of this song. That's what it's able to do. And I think if you were to make a criticism about it, it's that it's so incredibly solipsistic, you know, navel gazing, it's so much about himself. But the thing that he's able to do is that he makes it more universal. Like, it just is more universal. So he is making very specific references to things in his life, but he does it in such a way in which I feel it, okay? Maybe you don't, but I feel it. I feel that I have lived this guy's life. Bob Dylan doesn't do that, right? Bob Dylan doesn't actually talk about himself, ever. So maybe that's just a different need. Maybe these are different needs for different people. Maybe I should stop talking about Bob Dylan, Sky. You know what, I'm, I'm gonna talk to myself. Hey Sky, should I talk about Bob Dylan anymore? No, it's a bad point. So I also wanna talk about the cover of the album, which is a great example of the imagery that we see in the album. I remember looking at this on Bandcamp uh, and I was like, well, that's a, that's a pretty cool photo. And then I turned it upside down. And oh, that's actually the forward photo. That's the actual, that's the way you're supposed to look at it. But it's a great, I don't know. It's, the, it's a simple thing that helps to reinforce the atmosphere of the album, of a kind of looking at pictures of yourself, thinking about the places that you've been, the places that shape you, and how your note page can cover the camera. He is a real kind of troubadour, I would say. You know, like, it's an epic poem. It, it is, it's an epic poem. It goes all over the place. It's not linear, though. It's an epic poem that is completely non-linear. As far as influences go, you know, I read on Wikipedia all these different influences, but come on, everybody. It's just Neil Young. I mean, whatever influences there are, they are influences that started with Neil Young. I mean, the guitars on here, when electric guitars come in, they're super Neil Young-y, and so much of, the, so much of the, the feeling of people of my generation, so much of our music was so inspired and formed by the, the sort of grungy, punky aesthetic of Neil Young, and the kind of do-it-yourself, who cares what's successful uh, mentality of Neil Young. Um, there's a lot of metaphors on here, like a lot of metaphors. I'm not saying similes. There's not a lot of like, life is like this. It's like, I am going in the lake of the heart. He's not saying I'm going in a lake and the lake is like a heart. The primary metaphors have to do with water, waterfalls, seas, lakes. There's also a lot of moon action and a lot of yards. And there's a lot of this album that seems to be about what it is to be an artist. What is it to be an artist who started in 2001 in Washington, right? Like, what does it mean to be a somewhat successful musician? I mean, not successful enough for me to hear of them. I'm just not cool enough. But what does it mean to be a musician where you have to be super cool for people to know who you are? What would it, like? what would it be like to be that person for 20 years? There's a couple things I, I would wanna say too. Um, the name of the album is Microphones in 2020. I'll get to why later in the review. Um, I think there are alternate titles to the album that would be more interesting. I think you'd be tempted to say that the first line, like, any, like a lot of poems, the first line of a poem should be the title. The true state of all things. That's how he starts off. I don't think so. There's a line much, much, much later on in the song, which I think should be the title of this album. I was already who I am. It's the feeling, the bittersweet feeling of looking at this guy and realizing I was already who I am. I felt like I was in formation, but in a way, I was already done growing. 
But of course it's not true. But it is true. Gah. What if you could make an album that was like that? And so funny because so much of this music is about him and his journey as an artist and like these specific references. And I remember thinking, what if I was a big fan of P.W. Puffer stuff? Like I would be so happy, like, oh, I remember that. Oh, I've got that B-side. I remember when he went to Norway or I remember when he toured Northern Italy. But to me, I don't know who he is. And it's beautiful. It's liberating. It's an amazingly liberating experience. It's like walking in to a gallery show of an artist that you've never heard of and just seeing their full work, just, the, just like you start and you see their juvenilia and then you end when they find their style and you feel like you've learned something. Like you're not just like, like oh yeah, and there's another Liechtenstein, there's another Warhol. It's like, I have learned about So this. how do you approach a, an album that is one song? that is 44 minutes and 44 seconds of one basic idea. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna break them into instrumental changes. Because there are slight changes in instrumentation from time to time, a drum part will come in, a bass part will come in, a doubled voice, I'm going to do that. And I'm also gonna be referencing the years that he goes through, because he has so many years that he throws out, basically all in a very short period of time, when he was in his early to mid 20s, but still, uh, it's, it's a great example of, wait, I just, got the, I just got the joke of the title. Microphones in 2020. In hindsight. Hindsight is 2020. That's a stupid joke, PW Puffer Stuff. That's kind of funny. I'm sorry, I just, I just realized that right now as I was looking at my notes about other titles you could possibly have. Um, so he's looking back in hindsight in 2020 <gasps> at his past life. And I'm telling you, to Toby! I'm recording a video about the microphones. It's long enough as it is. Please stop barking. Okay. So let's start off with track one of this. The instrumental. Long guitars, seven minutes and 43 seconds of just guitar. And I think this is very important. Don't skip this. It sets the mood, it sets the tone, and there's something about the guitar tones, the way they go back and forth, apparently he only records on analog like uh, machines. So extra. Uh, he, you know, he apparently just does that. Also, his first art show is in a coffee shop. So extra. Uh, like, he, it has this great kind of back and forth to guitar feel. And there's a lot of tension and release in this album. So he builds up this tension of like, when is he going to sing? And quite often there'll be a chord change. It's like, wh when is it going to change? Because it's like two chords. It's like a C sharp minor. I looked it up and like a F sharp, and basically just two chords. But like when those chords happen, hold on to your butts because it's so exciting. So he starts singing the true state of all things. Da -da -da. And the thing is, I think he's sort of intentionally pompous at times. He's kind of winkingly grandiose at times but he can pull it off because of the great mixture in this song, in these lyrics, in this poem, between personal and poetical, just, just going in between them. And he includes a thesis statement at the end of this section. The true state of all things is a waterfall with no bottom crashing end and no ledge to plummet off, full of debris and flowers, never not falling. And in it we swim and fall, sometimes beside, often apart, it's just chaos heaving. This image of the waterfall as all of existence and all of state and beautiful and ugly, it matches a lot of this natural imagery, which is important on your third, third listening. And in particular, what I love is how he starts off this whole thing in saying that it's another day of not dying and another day of the sun rising. Actually, now that I think about it, there's a lot of sun in the beginning and a lot of moon at the end. But there's actually a lot of stuff that's pretty basic that, that weren't in my notes. <laughs> like very, very basic analysis that I haven't done here. But I'm doing it live in front of you right here. So that's fun. That's the best part of teaching, by the way, is when you realize something while you're teaching, <laughs> except the students never care. You're like, I just figured this out. I'm like, uh-huh. Is that going to be on the test? So... The, the not dying and the sun rising, the banality of these things, but also I think implied in it is the miracle of not dying and the miracle of the sun and the indifference of the sun. Lots of great little details in here between the personal and the poetic, uh, going through the contents of my backpack, shaking out the dust to bring some empty space back. Uh, he doesn't usually rhyme, but when he does, 
it can be interesting. Or maybe he does rhyme sometimes, and when I look at it, it doesn't feel like it rhymes, because he often feels like he's just trying to get these words out with this odd sometimes 4-4, four, four, sometimes 5-4 rhythm. And by the way, if you do know the time signature, just put it in the comments and I'll pin it, because I'm sure it's driving somebody crazy. Like, it's very clearly 13 7 eighths. Just tell me, I, I, don't, I don't care, I'm a dummy. Um, around 11.35, it gets my, what I call the, the when I was 20 section. So this, you have some Neil Young guitar coming in, and we're still with the sun. The distressed sun would still rise every morning, same as now. Dawn was loud. I took my breakfast to the couch on the porch of the punk house. I have never been to the punk house. I don't know what the punk house is. I don't care what it is. But I have definitely woken up with the sun in my early 20s and ate breakfast on a couch on a porch in a place which might have been called the punk house. A great, ex great explanation, a simple explanation of a certain phase of youth. Eating cereal on a couch. The, I mean, this guy, this guy was eating some cereal on some couches. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that anymore. All accented by a great, all accented. All accented. Wait, did I just put the wrong accent on the word accent? <laughs> That's really funny. Anyways, it's all accented by rumbling Neil Young guitars, which come like 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 electric going along this great acoustic guitar happening back and forth. Doom 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 doom. All and then it goes into talking about his life as a struggling musician, checking his Hotmail account. And it really starts rocking here. And then at 13 minutes in, around there, we get to the first of the sort of art artist statements. Like, what are the things that make my music me? And it's a matinee of the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Now listen, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is a good movie. It's like a kung fu art movie. I think it was made by Ang Lee. I might be wrong on that. Uh, that showed like wire work kung fu and made it for like a highbrow audience. And it was all like people flying around and like, like, like walking on sword blades and stuff like that. It's a very cool movie. But in this, in this song, what he does is it's not the kind of movie that, that a real serious artist would say was the basis of their music. It's just not highbrow enough. It's way too middlebrow. It's a great middlebrow movie, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It feels like it should be more, but it's not quite. But it's still great. And so he talks about it in this. He gives you the exact day, the exact day he went to the movie. Sunday, March 18th, 2001. And he saw it, and he talks about, and then this bass drum comes in. And the first time you hear a drum, the bass drum comes in, and he starts saying, at that moment, what was it? Oh, I decided I would make music that contained this deeper piece. So whatever it was he saw in this middle to highbrow movie would go on to determine the music he would make that I have never heard <laughs> that contained this deeper piece. And is mixed in with this funny image of him, I'm going to quote here, stood glowing with ideas of what I might try to convey with this music, and at that moment, my mind flashing like a blade, a 22-year-old in flip-flops, running around in an empty mall parking lot, lost in a martial arts fantasy. It looks ridiculous, but, uh, it looks ridiculous now, but the truth is, alone there, something was formed. And so while at the same time, this is about, this is about being a, a young man, and kind of a troubled young man and all that, it's also very much not about that. It's also about the artistic creation. It's about the process. It's also about the creative process. I apologize for the edits here. I don't like editing my videos. I only edit when there's a catastrophe like dogs barking. So my brother's coming to visit and he got here early and anyways, no big deal. Um, around 17 minutes after we get through this whole point of him saying, how is he gonna create music? How is he gonna create art? We've got the acoustic guitars going super strong, and we have what I call the double voice part. So we had the, the guitars, then we had the singing, and then we had the Neil Young part, and now we have the double voice. And these great details, I return to my station wagon. And if you watch the second viewing, the second listening, where you've seen the video, you see pictures of the station wagon all the time, with a wet face, extravagant solitude invigorates, and he talks about his wanting to create music and having wild swings at meaning. This guy is a great poet. Wild swings at meeting. meaning. I'm a terrible speaker. Wild swings at meaning. 
a great description of the artistic process. Uh, at around 18 minutes, uh, the lead guitar comes in, almost like solos a little bit, like half solo, talking about when I was 17 and 95, and here he starts talking about the tapes, the tapes that he used to make as a musician and the tapes that he used to listen to. And that's why I actually included this here in my little tableau here, because, you know, this, this, is, this is for me, you know? I got my Talking Heads tape there, Live Nirvana. Uh, this is like my band. I used to call myself the Zookeepers. And this is the only place that this music exists, is on these cassette tapes. This is a mix I made in college, Curtis Blow and Cool Modi. You know, like he's making this kind of reference, and it's not like cheap. It's not like a cheap nostalgic, like, remember cassette tapes, man? But it's talking again about this artistic process of what these tapes meant to him and how they led to this song. Because much of this song is about the making of this song. That's sort of the thesis of the song. And in the middle of it, he says, Kurt Cobain had died. I think this is important. Not Kurt Cobain killed himself. Not Kurt Cobain was killed. Not Kurt Cobain committed suicide. Kurt Cobain had died. This moment, which was a moment in civilization, it was a where, where were you when moment. I was in my driveway of my house, Belmont, Massachusetts. Um, but the next line is what's important. I had my driver's license and a girlfriend, and we'd cling to each other and dream that anything is permanent. Which is another one of the large things, which you've figured out now, because you've listened to this thing three times. You did your homework, I hope. I'm going to call on you. Um, permanence is a huge theme in this whole poem. Like, what is permanent? Nothing is permanent. Everything is permanent. So much of this album is about the sadness of unchanging. Like... Not just the sadness of change, but the sadness of unchanging. And also the impermanence of everything. Even back then, the beast of uninvited change insisted itself in, and look here, it still hangs. Then we get to what I call the stereo lab part. Crazy distortion comes in, totally covering up the vocals. This is why you need to read the, you need to read the lyrics the first two times. It's almost like a shoegazy, like doing great things where he's actually able to use distortion to get that rhythm that you heard in the, in the beginning part with that. I saw Stereo Lab in Bellingham and they played one chord for 15 minutes, something in me shifted, and I brought back home the belief that I could create eternity. So once again, we have Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hidden Tiger, Crouching Whatever, and then we have Stereo Lab. We're starting to get, and we have the Cranberries and Tori Amos and all these other people that he mentioned whose cassette tapes he had. And all of a sudden, we're in this world where we're starting to get the idea, everything's starting to become clear. Everything is giving something. So the deeper peace is a gift to him from Crouching Tiger, and then all of a sudden, we also have all this, this massive musical influence from these tapes, and then Stereo Lab, through their distortion and through their insistence on repetition, thought that you could create eternity. And he describes how he does that in his music. Around 22 minutes, the guitar stops, piano comes in, more feedback guitar, then the rhythm section, then the rhythm guitar comes back in and it just rolls on and on and has this instrumental moment of feedback. For a 44 minute song, you're never bored. And also part of the reason is that there's these moments of space. It begins in space and there's this just feedback time. Again, it reminds me of Neil Young. Electric guitars come in and is there like a piano? And then the distortion fades out and then it gets back to the main theme. Around 24 minutes, he talks about being 12 and 13 and playing in the sand and watching his younger brother uh, in a very sweet moment. I'm not even gonna spoil that for you. Just, this guy, I feel like I, I, feel like I grew up in Anacortes with him and that I had all these experiences. And he has this one line, when you are younger, every single thing vibrates with significance. And I believe that's true. And I think when he's talking about how things don't change, maybe the thing that changes is when you're this age, and also he talks about staring at zines. Seriously, how extra can this guy get? He talks about like staring at zines and reading you know, liner notes. And like everything seems so much more significant. And, and the thing that you lose in between here and here, the thing that you lose in, in this time uh, is that sort of belief that everything has significance. But in its place comes wisdom. But then that's the other problem. 
this guy doesn't really believe that he's any wiser. It's an amazing song written by a 42-year-old guy who doesn't actually think he is particularly wise and is constantly frustrated with wisdom. And I think, I'm just riffing here, the theme of permanence might indicate that one's ignorance is also permanent. And despite the illusion of wisdom, we're sort of destined to continue making the same mistakes. And if there is any permanence, it might be our own ignorance. No, just a thought. What, what, what do you think, super fans of uh, FW Bandersnats? Um, so then it gets even more poetic, more natural. He, there's a whole section about swimming into the lake of the heart. A different acoustic guitar comes in, like not the same thing that we heard before. And then there's accordions, like 200 accordions all playing. And then there's a little bit of respite, no lyrics. And then early 2003, two drums come in. Two, two drum sets come in. And he's playing the drums. He's got two drum sets going in. The guitar comes back. And he starts singing in the lake with his friends. And then he's contemplating the moon. We're on the back nine of this album. We're towards, not towards the end, but halfway through. So we're not talking about the sun. We're talking about the moon. And he's talking about just sitting there and sitting on a roof and talking about the moon. And it's kind of rocking. Let, let, me play, let me play a little bit of it just so you have an idea. You can hear this kind of cool rhythm. The, the cool instrumentation. Uh, yes. You hear how excited you were when he went to that second chord? <laughs> that resolution that gets built in here? And this beautiful lyric about the moon being a floating ball of rock and not something abstract. There's also a lot of playing back and forth with real things and abstract things. And he felt his size. Then the electric guitar comes crashing in when I was 17 in 1995. And maybe the longest section is where he talks about touring and being a rock and roll, an indie rock star that I'd never heard of because I'm not cool enough. I mean, I could have been listening to his music here. I mean, is there even a date on here? No, I don't know when that is. Um, he talks about like, living in Italy and touring. And I was living on an alternate plane, but set apart from this life where people wake and work and don't self uproot every day. And there's just guitar and the drums pop up. And there's a weird thing where he sees another band, Bonnie Prince Billy, a band that I've heard of, but never listened to because they just sounded lame to me. I don't know, are they good? <laughs> Uh, but what's cool is he talks about seeing them and seeing the playfulness of their persona. That's the, the term that he uses. And it's like his like exer, like, like insouciant calmness is, in, is attracted to their flamboyance, to their garishness. And he has this unbelievable section. I'm going to read in its entirety because God damn it, this is good music. Next time, next time you see these people who talk about how there's no good music anymore who have to watch YouTube videos of young people reacting to old music. You got it backwards, you dummies. You should be watching old people thinking about new music. Dinosaurs. Uh, this, this is an amazing section where he talks about the relationship between rock and roll music having the capacity to be a transformative artistic moment, like that which he is creating here. And countering that with the outward show, the superficiality, the face of the singer. The singer has to look good and he has to have a cool scarf on and he has to twirl around and jump. Who is it even that sings and who comes to life between the ears of the hearers in the rooms at night? And how can we all get deep? The packaging distracts from the nourishment it wraps. This guy's great.
Fixation on the singer's face or the band's name keeps us groveling and blind at the edge of a sea, unsubmerged in the singing waterfall, looking for a door into the mansion, taking this weird art project out into public, indulging in cultivated ambiguity about participants' identities, letting misperceptions hang because nothing is really true. The packaging distracts from the nourishment it wraps. And so here he is, and he's talking about what his band's name is, the microphones. I guess he changed his name to Lake Erie or Mount Erie or something else later. And then the bass comes in, and he talks about abandoning the name and changing it. And he goes this whole section where he talks about, uh, about how his band changed and how he changed as an artist until another band I've never heard of, I'm sure they're great, Mayhem, comes in. And when he mentions Mayhem, a lead guitar line comes in, and the lead guitar actually follows along with the melody of the, of the singer's voice. And then he gets super poetic here. Someone else lives in the house I used to live in and soon it will be torn down or burned. And who would even want to live in prolonged stagnation? I am older now and I no longer feel the same way that I did even five seconds ago. Again, permanence, impermanence. And apparently he's rebuilding a house in his hometown right now. So it makes sense. Somebody who's this obsessed with their past, with these pictures, with their hometown, there is something very true here that he's getting at. Then the piano. Piano? Did, did you call it piano? Why is there a piano in here? Piano comes in for a bit. And then as the song starts to end, the piano goes out a little bit and we have him saying he will never stop singing this tune. Now listen, it's 40, you know, you're like 40 minutes in at this point, but you're not sick of it. You just want it to keep going. He starts talking about a finger pointed at the moon, mistaken for something shining and true. I don't know if this is a reference to Bruce Lee, uh, where he, he chides a student for, I actually show this to my students, you know, you're like a finger pointing away at the moon. Don't focus on the finger or you will miss all of the heavenly glory. I don't know if that's what this is a finger pointed at the moon. But it is true. Like, is the moon something shining and true or is it just a big rock? Then the double voice comes in and the bass drum comes in and starts to like actually beat along with some of the words. And then we get to the, the end. I'm gonna read you the last bit. So what if I label this song Microphones in 2020? I hope the absurdity that permeates everything joyfully rushes out and floods the room like water from the ceiling, undermining all of our delicate stabilities, admitting that each moment is a new collapsing building. Nothing is true but this trembling laughing in the wind. Anyway, every song I've ever sung is about the same thing, standing on the ground, looking around, basically. If there have to be words. They could just be now only and there is no end. A statement of presentness, now only, and a statement of anxiety, of impermanence, of change, there is no end. And then there's silence and it ends at 44.44. <sighs> so thank you very much. I gotta get their names again. Yeah, I'm just gonna thank you very much to these two viewers, you can read your own names, for putting me on to this music. And if you're a fan of, of Doug Llewellyn, whatever this guy, P.F. Baflubaku, if you're a fan of his music, like what microphone should I listen to next? Uh, is Mount Erie better? It, does this song do as much as I think to encapsulate what this artist is? Ah, I'm too excited. This was great. What a great experience. Thank you, microphones, for making great art and for sharing it with us and for helping us all. There's the camera.